want to welcome you to Austin Heights Baptist Church this 19th Sunday after Pentecost. Will you join me in the greeting? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Now please stand. Go to each other with these ancient words of encouragement. The Lord be with you. All right, those of you who are seated on the outside, the seat pocket in front of you has a sign-up sheet, a little notebook. We ask that, uh, if you would please, take that, uh, record your attendance, uh, contact information, update any information, and pass that along for others on your row. On the inside of the announce are some announcements on the inside page. Uh, George, you've got a quilt. For those of you who are watching, I'm not a quilter, but uh, Pauline is a little in inhibited over here today, and so I'm making a presentation for the Prayers and Squares Quilt Ministry. This is a quilt for Velma Anderson, a friend of Sylvia St. Andrew. Uh, she's 94, had surgery, but not healing very fast, and she's in lots of pain, so prayers for uh, healing and to be free of pain. As the quilt is circulated around, we ask that you tie a knot on the string, right over left, left over right, and say a prayer. That's the most important thing. We also have, because we are all involved in this, we have some thank you notes from people who have received quilts recently. This is from the Greers uh, in... Um, In Corpus Christi, yes. Dear church members, we received the blanket <coughs> quilt <laughs> that you made yesterday. It is beautiful. Thank you so much. We need all the prayers we can get. Again, thank you so much. All our love, David and Gladys Green. And then from uh, Kent Ferguson, dear Austin Heights friends, we have a friend. Thank you so much for the beautiful prayer quilt. Since Judy brought it to me, I have used it every day. I love the nautical theme and especially the prayers and love that it represents. This is a wonderful ministry and I promise everyone who has received one feels the same way. Please accept this love offering to help continue this wonderful program. God bless you all. So you are reaching many people. Thank you. Note uh, the activities today, 2 o'clock at Bonita Creek Park, uh, setting, the location where it always is, is the annual Blessing of the Animals, sponsored by Humane Society and 
the Nacogdoches Ministerial Alliance. Uh, we hope to see you if you've got any animals, dogs on leashes, cats in cages, and, uh, uh, and it's always interesting to see what else shows up. Uh, yeah, there's always some of those. Choir practice today, okay. Baptism group confirmation group today at three. Then as you look at the other announcements coming up uh, the next week or two, note particularly Saturday, next Saturday, October the 14th, 8 to 12, work day at Steve and Kate Chisholm's house. This is uh, all of the things that they have uh, let pile up since last year. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Uh, you know, we, we, go, we have been going out to their house for 34 years like that, yeah. uh, for the Christmas uh, bonfire and other activities from time to time. And uh, we would like to participate in helping getting things, get things ready as we move into the, to the fall. And uh, lunch will be provided. So if you need to know more about that, you can see me um, or the call the church office and we will let you know but bring your gloves and we'll, most of that work of course will be outside picking up stuff and things like that so um, and Steve and Kay will give us directions you uh, yes I need to make it quick um, I want to thank everyone who participated attempted to participate help serve cook I wanted I have a special thanks uh, for uh, Joe Bartnick, Paul Thompson, and Jim Lemon for standing in for me at the at the Holy Smoker, and uh, three of So, oh, yeah, and uh, sorry, Barbara. Okay, so I <laughs> well, I, I was uh, we were very well represented. Uh, I can't talk. I'm sorry, represented. Uh, thank you so much for, for all of your support and participation. We don't have any final reports yet on how we did, but it, it sounds like we had a great time. I wish that I could have been there. I hate to miss it, but thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, just a note from Jim Lemon for next week at my house. Please wear sturdy shoes. <laughs> thank you. No, no, snake no, bites. no snake bites. Thank you, Steve. Well, related to the barbecue yesterday for the African American Heritage Project, which was great success, beautiful, beautiful weather. Denise, you have, you, thank you for your work too, Denise. It, uh, you worked so hard on organizing and serving. Yeah, so, uh, Denise, you've got an announcement about something and I don't remember what. The, the, the guidelines are usually if you're able to read, you're able to uh, help lead worship. It's one of the ways we learn best about worship and scripture and all that is by getting up here and doing it. Uh, so we mentioned October the 14th, the work day at Stephen Kay's, and then the next day, uh, October the 15th, uh, is our monthly Churchwide potluck lunch following the worship service, and you can also check with uh, the church office or with me if you need to know more about that. And of course, information will go out uh, online uh, during the week. Are there other announcements we need to know about? Okay. It, <clears throat> I, I don't want to ask this, but I want to. How many of you on a morning like this? would rather be out there than in here. <laughs> okay. Oh, we're not going to, that's a, that's an unofficial vote. So we're going to move. I'm going to try to, I got a, I got a involved sermon, but I'm going to move fast. Uh, let's take a deep breath. Let's breathe out all of the craziness of the week. Breathe in God's spirit. Let us worship God.
Please join me in the call to worship. In you, O oh God, we take refuge. Be a rock of refuge for us, a strong fortress to save us. Into your hands we commit our spirit. You have redeemed us, O oh Lord, faithful God. In the shelter of your presence you hide us. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. In you, O oh God, we take Let us pray. <coughs> oh God, we gather here in this hour, at this place, to worship you. We're here seeking a life with you and in you. You have charged us as your church to work for your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, creating a beloved community where we practice loving you and loving our neighbors. Guide us to be beacons of your love. Help us to raise a prophetic voice so that we may resist the hijacking of your name. Provide a counter witness to the abuse of faith known as white Christian nationalism. Help us do the work of building a better world for the oppressed and the marginalized while also examining our own practices, taking the logs out of our own eyes, as we attempt to do this work for you and for others. In your son's name we pray, amen. 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 You may be seated. We invite the children to come up to the front to be with Aunt Judy. Good morning, Sage. Good morning, Miss Mary. Good morning, Ethan. 
Jonathan, good to see everybody here this morning. Okay, today's lesson from the Bible here, here in the service is um, a story that Jesus told. And he told a story about someone who planted some good seeds. What would a good seed be? What would something that we want to grow? What would, what would a good seed? Tomatoes, very good. Oh, yum, yum. Okay, Winter? Watermelon, there's another good one. Okay, since Sage said tomatoes, we're gonna use tomatoes in our story. So this guy planted tomatoes, and he couldn't wait until the tomatoes grew and were ripe. But you know what? That night, after he planted his good seeds, some bad guys came, and they planted weeds in the garden so that the weeds would grow up around the tomatoes. Now, what would happen if weeds grew up around your plants, around your crops? Ethan? Yes, they, yes, they take up the water and choke them out, don't they, Winter? <clears throat> and what? Yeah, probably. So, so what happens then is um, if you don't weed, then it's so hard to gather those tomatoes and they won't be very good, will they? So Jesus said that we're kind of like those seeds. So let's think about if we were a good seed, if we were planting tomato seeds and we were a good seed, what are things that we can do or say that would be pleasing to God that help us grow up in God's way? Can you? Okay, we can be good. That's one thing we can do. Winter? Okay, don't be bad like a bad seed. How do we do that? How do we not be bad? What things can we do? Winter? Okay, help other people. Help God's creation. That means take care of the earth, right? Can you think of some other things? <coughs> other things we can do to be sage? Um, take, care of the take what? Take some deep oh, take some deep breaths. Okay. Yeah. Take some deep breaths and enjoy the, the air that fills our lungs. And um, thank God. Be thankful for that. Ethan, got one? <laughs> Don't pollute. That's another good one. Winter? forgot what you were going to say. That's okay. That happens to me all the time. Okay. What we want to think about is as we go in our lives, we want to be like that good seed. We want to be a good juicy tomato that grows um, good and firm and pretty and red. So as we go along in our life, let's think about being that good seed that's planted and, um, and think about uh, growing in God's way that God would have us to live. Let's say a prayer. Loving God, we thank you that you do love us, whether we're a good seed or sometimes a bad seed. We pray that you will help us to love others as you have taught us to, even when it's hard to love some bad seeds. We pray that you will be with us as we go and enjoy this beautiful day. We thank you for all your creation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys are going with uh, Miss Maggie and Miss Denise today. They're waiting for you. Thank you, Aunt Judy. Thank you, children. Now, as they make their way to the back, I ask you to look on the back page of the order of service at our prayer list. At the same time, our ushers are coming forward with prayer cards. Cards are available for you. If you'd like to send a note, a card to someone telling them that we're praying for them, please uh, raise your hand. They'll pass to you as many as you would like. Mind, I'll lead us in prayer, and then we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let's bow our heads together, please. Oh God, we come to you this morning with our prayers. We ask that you hear us. 
we ask that you help us be patient in the middle of what feels like chronic emergencies. It's hard being patient. It's hard to wait in the middle of emergencies. We want to do something. We want to fix it. We want to solve it. Help us learn to trust you. Take a deep breath and learn to wait and listen. Meanwhile, oh God, part of our waiting and listening is trusting that you're at work. That even though we're waiting, we can wait in peace because you are at work bringing about change and hope and healing and encouragement and peace. We especially pray for peace in Israel and the Middle East. We ask for your help. We're overwhelmed by the news. Please, oh God, hear our prayers. Pray for our neighbor, the ones who are sitting near us this morning. Help us be an encouragement to each other. Help us be your people who encourage and are patient and loving in this community. This and more we pray through Christ Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin first in silence. Please join me in the corporate confession. Guiding God, we have not always gone where you would lead us. We have made wrong choices and have not learned the lessons of our ways. We have traveled through waters that threaten to engulf us, but we have forgotten your protective care. Have mercy upon us who are complacent in the face of your miracles and grace, and guide us in the way that leads to life, so we may follow you wherever you call us to go.
And now for the scripture. Um, I'm reading from the New Revised Version of the Bible at Kyle's suggestion. Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30, 36 through 43. The parable of the weeds. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I'll tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it to my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came in to him and said, uh, explain to us what that parable of the weeds was in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom, everything that causes sin, and all who do evil. They will throw them in the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, choir. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I hate to begin this way, but just last year, member of Congress Marjorie Taylor Greene said, quote, we need to be the party of nationalism, and I'm a Christian, she said, and I say it proudly, we should be Christian nationalists. Also last year, that moral exemplar, Representative Lauren Boebert said, quote, the church is supposed to direct the government. The government is not supposed to direct the church. This was at a church, she said this, two days before her election, uh, primary election victory. She went on to say, I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk. Now, in times past, we might have written off such statements as wacko extremism, but public opinion polling shows that support for Christian nationalism is growing among people who identify as conservative Christian, especially white conservative Christian. In tumultuous times, Christian people have often sought a return to what is perceived as a stable and moral and religious society and civil state. Now they did this in the 17th century and they tend to do this today. I mentioned this in the context of our congregation having a series of conversations about dropping the name Baptist, capital B Baptist, but remembering that we are clearly uh, Baptist, small b Baptist, and I want to talk about why this is such a big deal about being a Baptist, small b Baptist. 1644, Massachusetts Bay Colony passed a law against all Baptists, or Anabaptists as they were called then, charging them with being incendiaries of commonwealths and the infectors of persons in matters of religion. And if you oppose infant baptism or you try to talk other people into opposing infant baptism or if you oppose the magistrate's rule in matters of religion, you shall be banished, the law said. So a great question to ask is, why was everybody so upset about the Baptist? Well, uh, why in the 17th century in New England was this such a threat? What did we do? to cause such laws to be passed. Now, only 14 years before this, the governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony, John Winthrop, had those famous words, for we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. And Winthrop, along with all of his Puritan brothers and sisters, had escaped old England in persecution to build this city on a hill where they believed true faith and true light could be a sign or a beacon to the entire world. Now, they believed that old England was supposed to be the elect people of God. Protestant Reformation had been going on for around 100 years. Uh, the, they freed the Bible and people from a corrupt church, they believed. God was calling England, old England, to be a new Israel. After all, in 1588, under the great Queen Elizabeth, God had blessed England by turning back the anti-Christian armada of Catholic Spain. This is what they were all believing, and they believed this was a premonition of Armageddon and the book of Revelation. England was favored by God in a role paralleled only by ancient Israel, an elect nation destined to lead the world back to God's true religion and end the tyranny of Antichrist. Elizabeth died, kings of England began to vacillate. James I, Charles I, really supported a different kind of Anglo-Catholic Church of England. And the kings were against the Puritans. The Puritans sought to purify the Church of England. Then there were the separatists who were also opposed by the king who had given up on purifying and they decided they decided to separate 
and start over a new church in a new place, which they did in 1620 by landing at Plymouth Rock. Ten years later, 1630, John Winthrop and the Puritans show up in what they, a place they call Boston. Both Puritans and Separatists there in New England believe that old England was fumbling the opportunity to be the new Israel, the elect of God. That the, and so therefore, New England was to be God's chosen people. So get this, be clear about this in your head. New England was God's chosen nation, the successor to biblical Israel. It didn't take long that all of the American colonies began to be seen as God's chosen nation, a city upon a hill. And eventually, this developed into the notion that America was God's chosen nation and had a manifest destiny. Now this is what we call Christian nationalism, the merging and mixing of church and state. Christian nationalism was the assumption of John Winthrop in Boston in 1630. It's an undercurrent in American history ever since. There are more benign versions and other more hostile versions, but it's an ongoing current. And when people feel like society's falling apart, the stability and order of religion is very tempting, mixing church and state, putting chaplains in the public schools instead of counselors, trying to funnel public money into private schools, most of which are religious schools, though the governor calls them school choice or vouchers. You can call it in by any number of names. It's ver different versions of Christian nationalism. Now, 379 years ago, we were called incendiaries of commonwealths and the infectors of persons in matters of religion. Small congregations, they were all small, like Austin Heights Baptist Church, were threats to religious nationalism then. And if we pay attention to our Bibles and to what's going on around us, we will be now. Now, from 1631, when he arrived in Boston until his death in 1683, Roger Williams was one of those the Christian nationalists considered incendiaries of commonwealths. Now, he was a capital B Baptist only for a short time, founding First Baptist Church of America, Providence, Rhode Island, in 1638. But he was always a small B Baptist, He's a hero of mine, and he's a reason why I'm still a Baptist preacher and probably why this church uh, became, became, was a Baptist church when it started and has remained so. Now, one of William's favorite passages was the one Susan read just a moment ago. It's chapter 13 of Matthew. It's the parable of the sower, uh, uh, and uh, the whole chapter is full of Jesus' agrarian uh, parables. This is the parable of the wheat and the weeds, also known as the wheat and the tares. Jesus says a farmer went out to sow good wheat in his field, but somehow during the night someone came along, sowed weeds among his wheat. As the young plants grew, the farmhands noticed they had a pretty good crop of weeds. So they went, uh, so they went in to the farmer, the head boss, and said, uh, boss, we're getting pretty lax and lazy around here. You got weeds in your field. Now, are you ready for us to go out, pull them up, and throw them in the burn pile? Give us a few days. And we'll have this farm looking good and neat again. Give us permission. We'll get this society back on the straight and narrow. We'll do, a, do away with this woke stuff, get us back to old-fashioned morality with restrictions on voting and return to mandated prayer in the public schools. And the farmer says, hold it, hold it. Take a deep breath. I want you to be careful. The weed infestation we have is a weed called Darnell. It looks like wheat. And when it grows up right beside the wheat plant, the root system of the two plants become intertwined so that when you pull up the weed, the Darnell, you end up pulling up the wheat as well. So. The head farmer, the boss, says, we're going to need to wait until harvest time. 
And you fellows, you workers, you servants, you lighten up. Let it all grow together, and then at harvest, we'll reap all of it and separate it out. The farmhands went out once more reminded of whose farm it was and that they were just servants, not rulers. Now, in any parable of Jesus, we always ask, where are we standing in the story? And Roger Williams was very attentive to these questions. Verse 38, he zeroed in on verse 38. Jesus says the field is the world. And for Williams, that meant that living in the world meant wheat and weeds live alongside one another. Faithful Christians were to live alongside all sorts of people. Some were simply hypocrites, while others might be heretics, false Christians, idolaters, backsliders, anti-Christians, and on and on and on. Much of the time, like wheat and weeds, you cannot easily tell one from the other. So here was a mixed and diverse society, a field with wheat and weeds all mixed together. And though the farm workers slash civil servants slash clergy might want to pull up the weeds, persecute those who were not considered faithful Christians, William saw this parable as saying everyone was to live together peacefully. Someday, God will do the sorting. Now, Williams was no anarchist, although the Puritans uh, accused him of being one. He said, if you broke civil law, if you were a thief, if you got drunk, if you got in fights or other things, then William said you needed to, fight, you needed to face civil justice. But civil law and justice had, had nothing to do with faith and conscience. Now, if that was not radical enough for 17th century Christian nationalists, Williams went even further. Williams said, living together in the peacefully also included the Narragansett indigenous people. Now, they had never heard of such thing, the, the Puritans, that we were supposed to get along with the indigenous tribes around. Roger Williams, by the way, Christina had a facility for language. This guy was good. Soon after arriving in New England in 1631, he reached out to the local indigenous peoples, learned their languages. Eventually, being able to speak their language, it developed a lot of, opened some doors that others didn't have. They developed personal relationships. They opened up trade opportunities, agricultural helps, learned from the indigenous folks, allowed him the diplomatic ability to peacefully work through conflict, and besides, and perhaps most importantly, knowing their language opened a window into their culture and allowed Williams to see things from the Narragansett perspective. So in turn, when he was banished from Massachusetts Bay Colony in the winter of 1635, the Narragansetts took him in and gave him shelter. And in the spring, Williams purchased land from them and found what became Providence, Rhode Island. Williams believed the local indigenous people were creatures of God just like everyone else and were to be treated with respect and dignity. He did not believe in the doctrine of discovery that said European Christians could take whatever they wanted from non-Christian people. Now, Williams did not believe in some sort of live and let live. Everyone is spiritual in their own way. He had a strong doctrine of human sin. He believed that the only chance we have is by the grace of the living God. But the grace of God can only be known freely and non-coercively. You cannot force it. You can't go around and pull up the weeds. You cannot and must not use violence. Williams believed that most of the corruption and sinfulness of the church and so-called Christian society over the previous 13 centuries was due to Christians using violence and persecution to force their way. Only a free conscience can respond to the grace of God, and the grace of God only comes nonviolently. He believed deeply, if you're using force, 
coercion, manipulation. It's not the grace of God. Now, in 1644, the same year that the Massachusetts Bay Colony outlawed the Baptist, Roger Williams was in England pleading the case of giving Providence its own charter, charter so they would not have to answer to the Bay Colony. Williams wrote his most famous book, The Bloody Tenet of Persecution, and he said, quote, Men's consciences ought in no sort to be violated, urged, or constrained, and whenever men have attempted anything by this violent curse, whether openly or by secret means, the issue has been pernicious. In the cause of great and wonderful innovations, the mightiest kingdoms and countries, this can, and then he went on to say, this cannot be a true religion which needs carnal weapons to uphold it. Now, the same year Williams... Uh, wrote that in the same year the New England Puritans were outlawing the Baptists. the same time, Williams, one of his best friends, was John Milton, the great poet. Reading Williams and reading Milton, I wish Milton had helped Williams with his prose. <laughs> Milton wrote to the English Parliament his most famous prose work, Areopagita. And, and Milton said, let truth and falsehood grapple. Whoever knew truth put to the worse in a free and open encounter. In other words, Milton said, this was about banning books. And Milton said there should not be banning, censoring, or restricting books because Milton believed, and so did Williams, all truth comes from God. And if you give truth room and freedom, it's going to win every time. Now, Williams was saying the same thing about conscience. God is at work and does not need, indeed does not want, coercion or force. Leave conscience alone and let God work. Now, as I mentioned, Williams started the Baptist Church in 1638, the first Baptist church in America. But the more Williams read the book of Revelation, the more convinced he became that the true church would only come about when Christ came again. He eventually left the Baptist church, though he always defended and supported Baptists through all his and our trials and tribulations. In 1644, in Bloody Tenet of Persecution, he says, God hath made a hedge or wall of separation between the garden of the church and the wilderness of the world. And he says, every time the state magistrates or clergy working with the state try to interfere with conscience or with faith it's crossing the state the magistrates are crossing the wall and interfering in God's garden for Williams religious liberty freedom of conscience meant the state stayed out of it God's intention that there is a separation 150 years go by Thomas Jefferson was president 1802 Jefferson received a letter from the Danbury Baptist in Danbury, Connecticut. They wrote to Jefferson to commend him for his stand in favor of religious liberty and to express their dissatisfaction with the church-state relationship in Connecticut. There was not separation of church and state and religious liberty in Connecticut until 1818, in Massachusetts until 1833. Religious liberty, they said, meant that church and state must be separate. And Jefferson wrote back, Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. He's quoting First Amendment. And then he said, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. So do you, have, do you now have an idea of why a Christian nationalist in Massachusetts Bay Colony outlawed the Baptist? Do you have a better idea? Do you have an idea of why Roger Williams is so important to us? And finally, hear me on this. 
I have a suggestion. If we're going to change our name, we change our name to Austin Heights Incendiaries of Commonwealths. <laughs> In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one true God, Mother of us all, amen. God, please help us commit to you instead of the pressures from the outside world. Help us to set a good example of the Christianity of Jesus, to serve those most needy, and to be loving examples to others. When others seek to become more insular and self-focused, remind us to do the opposite and throw open our arms and the doors of the church. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 I ask you to remain standing and open your hymn book to this wonderful old hymn, number 638. Precious Lord, take my hand. In a moment when we sing this hymn, I'll be here at the front to receive anyone who professes Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, saying that you want to be a part of Austin Heights Baptist Church. We'll receive you as we sing. <laughs>
people said. Amen. Let's take each other's hands for our benediction. Now look who you're holding hands with. Hold on tight because we're going to need each other this week. Now may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and give you grace. May the countenance of God be upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ben.